Chapter 8. Transit. After being tried for 18 months, a street railroad in Richmond, Virginia, which has been operated by electricity, has been declared a failure, and the company will go back to horse or mule power. The Railway Age, 1889. 8.1. Omnis Omnibus. From 1662 to 1675, mathematician Blaise Pascal secured a royal monopoly from King Louis XIV to operate a carrosse à cinq sous, five penny coaches, seven horse-drawn vehicles carrying six to eight passengers along five regular routes in Paris. Pascal's routes, serving the wealthy classes but not soldiers or peasants, did not last much more than a decade. They were expensive. The working class would take in roughly eight sous per day, so one ride was more than half the daily income. Fixed route transit service followed upon the more common taxi services. In 1617, Nicolas Sauvage established a business of hired cars serving Hotel de Saint Fiacre at the location of the first taxi stand. Saint Fiacre became the patron saint of taxis. Early services included the Oystermouth Railway in Wales, which began passenger service in 1807 and is also the first fare paying passenger rail service, in Mexico City, which had public transit as early as 1820. In the 1820s, Stanislaw Beaudry, proprietor of a local public baths, opened a transport service in Nantes to serve his customers. In the event, people got off along the route and fixed route transit was reborn. One of the first bus stops there was in front of a hatter shop owned by a man named Omnis. The Latin word omnibus means for all and the slogan Omnis Omnibus, all for all, was used. The name was eventually clipped to Omnibus and then Bus. Baudry soon expanded to Paris by 1828, taking the name Omnis Omnibus with him. Competition soon followed. Ultimately, motorized omnibuses in France began to be called the Autobus. Sadly, Baudry committed suicide in 1830. The omnibus idea expanded to London by 1829, where George Shillabier, a coachmaker, started service. The first horse-drawn omnibus in the United States, a 12-seater named Accommodation, plied New York City's Broadway from Battery to Bleecker Street, for one shilling, 24 U.S. cents, starting in 1827. It was organized by Abraham Brower, a stagecoach operator, who also helped start the New York Fire Department. Others soon followed, and then a horse-drawn street railroad was launched in 1832 from 4th Avenue at 14th Street to the Bowery at Prince Street. By 1850, 593 omnibuses ran on 27 routes in New York, though no new horse car tracks were laid. The figure illustrates the history of streetcars in the U.S. In the upper left corner of the figure is a tram or horse car using rope or cable haulage, the John Mason, placed in service in New York City in 1832. Note both its similarity to road coaches and how later designs evolved. Omnibuses could be found in other cities as well. In Washington, D.C., an omnibus ran from Georgetown to Navy Yard as early as 1830, following an earlier streetcar. Horse trams on rails had been used in special circumstances such as mining, for a long period of time, and they appeared in cities as passenger traffic grew enough to warrant investment in rails. These trams were quite competitive with the omnibus because of higher productivity, larger vehicles, and increased speeds. Because rail investment was required, firms provided the service. New York had over 30 tram roads by 1860. 8.2 Going Underground Prior to the advent of the steam railway, London was a metropolis of just over one million people. It was well served by both canals and turnpikes, connecting to other parts of Great Britain. Internally, there were omnibus services. The London and Greenwich Railway was the first of many railways to reach London, with the first section opening in 1836 and being completed in 1838, making it possible to reach Greenwich in 12 minutes instead of the hour required by horse-drawn omnibus or steamboat. Famously built on a viaduct, the route was initially paralleled by a tree-lined boulevard that operated as a toll road, serving those unwilling to pay rail fares. However, the toll road was disbanded when the viaduct was widened to enable more frequent services to the densely populated urban core, ultimately growing from two tracks to 11. Soon, many other railways sought to connect to London. To avoid disruption in the core, a Royal Commission on Railway Termini appointed in 1846 drew a box around central London and decreed no line shall enter the cordon. The box resembles the congestion charging zone adopted in the early 21st century, which aimed to reduce cars rather than prohibit trains. The result was railway terminals locating on the edges of the central region. London, like many cities, 
has no unified railway station, as the north, south, east, and west lines have no common intersection. The problem is worse, though, in London, as even lines from the north run by different organizations would be built adjacent. St. Pancras, King's Cross, or nearly adjacent, Euston, stations without convenient interchange. Later, between 1858 and 1860, some penetrations of the box were permitted by Parliament, but most of the city of London, the original walled city where the financial district still lies, remained untouched. While preventing railways from severing the most densely populated part of the city, which would have been expensive for both the railways and the city, it created a need for a connection between the termini to allow transfers. The Metropolitan Railway, a private concern like all railways of the era, but with some support from the Corporation of the City of London, was approved by Parliament in 1854. It aimed to connect the northern termini, Paddington, Euston, St. Pancras, King's Cross, and Farringdon, which was later added to the plan, to ease movement for through travelers. The trends in the City of London were quite different from the rest of London. The City of London has seen a long trend of depopulation from 1851, prior to the first underground line and for many years saw increasing employment, lending support to the notion that the railways, especially the underground, enabled decentralization of residences and concentration of employment. The Metropolitan Railway opened in January 1863 and was extremely successful. Clearly, the market was much larger than the interline transfers. The firm paid dividends throughout its life. Emulation is the proof of success. Many new railway lines were proposed. The 219 London area railway bills brought before Parliament during the period 1860 to 1869 totaled 1,420 kilometers. Some of those lines were proposed prior to the opening of the Metropolitan, indicating the smell of success was in the air, though the peak years were between 1863 and 1866, following closely on the heels of the Metropolitan's opening. The most important of these was the Metropolitan District Railway, later called the District Line which ran just north of the River Thames, but south of the Metropolitan, connecting a number of the Southern Railway Termini, Victoria, Charing Cross, Blackfriars, Cannon Street. Proposals for what became the Circle Line service linking the Metropolitan and District, roughly inscribing the box described above, were quickly proposed, but the two lines were not connected on both ends until 1884. Both the Metropolitan and District lines were constructed using cut and cover techniques. Later lines from the City and South London Railway first section opened in 1890 onwards, generally used deep level tunneling techniques to avoid disruption of city streets, existing railway lines, and public utilities when they needed to be below grade. Outside the circle line, however, the railways could emerge above ground and competed fiercely in some markets while operating unfettered in others to provide suburban services. In some cases, this involved building new lines and others it involved acquiring running rights or on or ownership of existing lines. The development of suburbs was a way to develop traffic for lines that in the city, though profitable, were operating below maximum capacity and thus maximum profitability. Eight point three above and below New York. The London Underground opened in eighteen sixty three. By eighteen seventy other cities tried to copy. In New York, the publisher of Scientific American, Alfred Beach, constructed in secret a short pneumatic tube railroad under Broadway. That it was constructed in secret at night is surprising to modernize. It was done because Beach did not have the approval of the boss Tweed ring, then governing New York City. Ultimately, Tweed killed this nascent technological path, though his influence over the governor, who instead approved charters for elevated railroads. Though Beach tried to lower costs by switching from shield tunneling to cut and cover, and Tweed soon went to jail, he could never get enough financial support to proceed. New York was condemned to elevated railroads rather than subways for the next 34 years when a new, non-secret subway was opened. Elevated railways, L's, were constructed in Manhattan beginning in 1870. The initial foray using cable technology was soon replaced with steam engines, basically a railroad in miniature, though the gauge was standard. L's were eventually found on 9th, 6th, 3rd, and 2nd Avenue, and the latter two of these routes were ultimately extended to the Bronx. Manhattan Railways, their operator, was controlled by famed rail financier Jay Gould, along with partner Russell Sage. These were electrified between 1900 and 1903, adopting the multiple unit control system developed by Frank Sprague, which was also applied to streetcars. Despite New York's vastly greater population, Boston preceded New York in operating a successful subway line, 
opening in 1897 with trolley cars operating in a subway adjacent to Boston Common. Electricity enabled deep bore subways, which steam made infeasible for anything but cut and cover technology. For instance, the Pennsylvania Railroad, which previously served New York City via ferry from New Jersey, now could tunnel under the Hudson and open up a station on the island of Manhattan. In 1894, municipal voters under the leadership of New York Mayor Abram Hewitt approved the Rapid Transit Act, authorizing a new Rapid Transit Commission to contract with a private firm to construct and operate for 50 years a subway line. The Rapid Transit Construction Company, later the Interborough Rapid Transit Company, was formed to bid on this contract, led by John B. McDonald and August Belmont. After being awarded the contract, it acquired the Manhattan Railway Company, operator of the L's, so that it could offer integrated service. Fares were capped at a nickel. The initial route was dubbed Contract 1 and its extension, Contract 2. Advantages of shallow excavation, cut and cover over deep bore tunneling included easier access to the tunnel from the ground and once operating shorter distances for travelers so that elevators would not be required. The major downside was the expense of utility relocation and shoring existing buildings. The new cars were eventually built of steel rather than wood, though there was some concern about the greater difficulty of rescue given a crash with steel construction, axes have a hard time breaking through steel, the greater protection in event of a crash proved to be a more important consideration. In the first year, the New York subway attracted 106 million passengers. Advertising on the subway platforms was an early issue. The franchisee for advertising was Artemis Ward, descended from the eponymous U.S. Revolutionary War General. Opponents were not happy that advertising obscured the then new and nice tile work in the subway stations. Proponents argued that advertising provided useful information for potential customers. This tension would last for decades. The Washington Metro famously limited in-station advertising, while other systems, less graced by federal largesse, embraced it more widely. Belmont's IRT ultimately took over the Metropolitan Street Railway Company, consolidating control over transit. However, the Brooklyn Rapid Transit Company, operator of the L's in Brooklyn, was given authority to build subway lines into Manhattan. The BRT entered Manhattan in 1908, taking its elevated trains across the Williamsburg Bridge, into a Manhattan subway. The control of transit became one of many fronts in local newspaper rivalries. The New York Times supported Belmont and continued private control of the subway, suggesting the test of a subway was a reasonable certainty of profit, while William Randolph Hearst's newspaper supported municipalization. The 1908 Ellsberg Law shortened the length of contracts, which made it more difficult for potential competitors to enter the subway market as they would have less time to amortize fixed capital costs like power stations. It was passed over the opposition of the Rapid Transit Commission. The dual system was established in 1913, locking in the BRT and the IRT as the dual private subway providers. The dual system established the network for each, providing competition in Manhattan, while the IRT dominated the Bronx and BRT was the primary provider in Brooklyn and Queens. Initially, IRT and BRT supported the five-cent fare because it provided a minimum floor that could not be violated. It later turned into a difficult ceiling for them. BRT went into receivership in 1918 after a strike in the resulting tragic Malvern Street wreck, among other events. It was reorganized as the Brooklyn Manhattan Transit Company, BMT. The IRT narrowly averted the same fate. In 1924, a new independent city-owned system, the IND was established, opening in 1932, to compete with the private BMT and IRT, with a line from Bronx through Manhattan to Brooklyn. While fares were fixed, competition was hoped to improve quality of service, and the new line would add needed capacity on a system now handling over 700 million riders per year. The capacity on different services varied as they were constructed at different times and used slightly different technologies. At the time, of the IND opening, the IND could move 90,160 passengers per hour per track, the BMT 73,680, and the IRT 59,400. Later technological improvements in signaling improved capacity on the BMT and IRT. Turnstiles were also innovated to improve flow entering congested stations and the accuracy of revenue collection. The downturn in the U.S. economy was felt in New York. The IRT went into receivership in 1932, like the BRT before it. The private lines were municipalized in a process called unification that was complete in 1940. Only $19 million from the IRT and none from the BMT was recovered to repay the funds laid out by the city as part of the dual contracts. 
New York also has a number of commuter railroads, notably Metro North and the Long Island Railroad, a separately operated path, Port Authority Trans-Hudson service into Lower Manhattan from New Jersey, and Staten Island Rapid Transit, which does not directly connect with the rest of New York's transit. Unlike the Underground of London or the streetcars of Minneapolis-St. Paul, the subways in New York City largely followed existing populations rather than being built into greenfields and acted as an agent of decentralization from Lower Manhattan. Eight point four transit surfaces. Early railroads penetrated cities along lakefronts, along rivers, or through lands that had not already been co-opted for urban purposes. But in cities like London and New York, where the urban area was large and dense, railroads were unable to penetrate all the way to the heart of the city. The passenger market was a big part of the rail business, and railroads established passenger stations as close to the centers of urban markets as practical. For competitive and geographic reasons, each railroad established its own stations. Union stations serving multiple railroads came in later in a few cities, notably in North America, Chattanooga, Cincinnati, Denver, El Paso, Indianapolis, Kansas City, Los Angeles, Nashville, St. Louis, St. Paul, Toronto, Washington, D.C., and Winnipeg. To accommodate non-bulk freight, teaming yards were also built near downtown. Because of the requirements for car storage as well as room to work teams of horses, the yards involved considerable amounts of land. As cities grew, additional teaming yards and considerable industrial track were constructed. Today, the parts of cities built during the period we are describing have considerable interlacing of rail facilities within them. With continuing urban growth, higher capacity modes became practical, even in cities not as primate as London and New York. The reliance on horse, both for personal and mass transportation, was problematic, not just for the cost and the pollution that resulted in manure, but also the risk of disease from interacting with animals on a regular basis. The shift from feed for animals to fossil fuels for energy became more and more justified as energy conversion processes were improved and favored fossil fuels. Along routes where traffic warranted, steam trains were run. These evolved into subway elevated systems, commuter railroads, or some combination of the two, as noted in earlier sections. The superior technology for many surface streets next became the cable car, and cable car systems were installed in many cities. Electric utilities promoted and often owned electrically powered transportation properties. The markets the properties provided aided the utilities were providing for baseload, aiding in the achievement of scale economies in production and distribution of power, and also aiding the diffusion of service throughout urban areas. Rail-like services pushed aside other services, so the predominant technology of transit shares much with railroads, as does the embedded policy. Public policy was railroad policy writ small for the scale of the city. Systems were given charters, franchises, by the cities, and policies treated safety, service, and prices. A flat fare policy was widely adopted, usually five cents. The suburban railroads used distance-graded fares. The five-cent fare was not a burden in the early years when traffic was increasing and economies of scale were achieved. It became a burden as, in, as inflation, especially at about the time of World War I, decreased buying power, and the Transit Workers Union demanded higher wages and better working conditions. Electric railways, streetcars, or trams were deployed rapidly between 1895 and 1915. As is true of lots of new developments, some false starts were made. However, once established, streetcars or trams enjoyed a sharp cost advantage over precursor systems. Numbers we have seen suggest that the cable car gave a cost saving over horse cars of about 20%. At first, cost savings were not so marked for streetcars because of the voltage drops on early DC streetcar lines. It wasn't until AC electric power was more widely distributed that converters could be used to supply DC to outlying lines. Car size and service frequency adjusted to markets, streetcars quickly won over cable car markets except in very hilly terrain. Cable car mileage peaked in 1893. The cost comparisons tell only part of the story because electric cars were larger than precursor vehicles, and they offered service advantages such as higher speeds. These electric railways and steam trains where they had been deployed previously had considerable impact on the form of cities. Suburban development increased and downtowns could draw on larger areas for labor, sales, and service activities. In short, the centralizing, decentralizing forces that we usually associate with the automobile were quite strong before the automobile entered the city. Streetcar or tram service was highly desired. Cities were quick to issue franchises. There was overbuilding of lines and some lines were not well connected to others. The opportunity, need, and ability to consolidate rail property seemed to have varied greatly from city to city.
In Los Angeles, some 13 systems became the Los Angeles Railway Corporation. By 1890, there were four properties. Consolidation was complete by the time automobiles began to appear in numbers, 1910 and onward. Washington, D.C. had 27 distinct streetcar railways chartered between 1862 and 1902 and also consolidated. These railways were tied to real estate development. At about the time rail transit services became available, cities were growing very rapidly. The highest growth rates for cities occurred at the turn of the 20th century. Making land available for many types of development, the transit services had massive off-system effects. The physical realizations of the impacts included streetcar suburbs and the decentralization of shopping from the central business district to outlying retail centers. The system suffered from the ills we will be discussing for the railroads, railitis. The problem of the five-cent fare has been mentioned. Route and service rationalization was needed due to duplicating properties. Desirable network connections were needed because lack of physical connections and or transfer rights thwarted end-to-end services. Congestion occurred during rush hours, yet low demand characterized some routes and times of the day. Importantly, the systems had lost much public support. In the 1890s, transit was regarded as highly desirable from a social point of view. Transit-based developments reduced residential crowding and made job sites available. Yet, by 1920, systems were regarded as poorly managed ripoffs. Problems became acute by the 1910s and 1920s when the car and truck began to provide competitive services and other factors affected the transit market. The truck eased the logistics problems of stores in decentralized locations that reduced CBD shopping activities. With automobility, such activities no longer needed to be on transit lines. The truck also enabled the decentralization of many kinds of manufacturing, especially the activities that had previously found their most desirable locations near the downtown rail freight yards and where labor could travel to work using CBD-oriented transit. With activities at decentralized locations, the automobile offered an option for the journey to work. The adoption of electric motors and other factors began to favor single-store manufacturing establishments. Land requirements influenced the building of new plants at the outskirts of cities. Actually, the early impact of the auto on transit was modest. At first, the automobile was used for recreational travel and was considered a rich man's toy. Only later did it begin to be used for the journey to work and for shopping as the sites of those activities began to shift. The competitive impact of the automobile differed depending on city morphology and type of public transport. Today, for example, the CBD of Chicago continues to be served by transit in its historical forms, which Charles Yerkes helped establish, commuter rail, subway elevated, and bus, which substituted for the streetcar. Other factors affecting the demand for public transport included growth in real incomes and the shortening of the work week from six to five days. As a result of the factors at play, transit demand, which had been roughly evenly distributed seven days of the week, was reduced on Saturdays and Sundays. The morning and evening peaks of traffic became relatively steeper as off-peak CBD shopping and travel for warehousing and manufacturing work in the vicinity of the CBD decreased. All of the developments required planning. Most was project planning in style and scope, and its first client was the city government because franchises were needed before work could go forward. The topic of how the system was to be operated, fares and schedules, was treated because it was of great interest to governments. Consolidation of planning or rationalization had a different style. It extended to the best ways to combine properties and the appropriate treatment of stakeholders in the properties. These plans were developed by relatively famous consultants from out of town and were usually sponsored by city governments. Eight point five Metroland. The suburban extensions of what came to be known as the London Underground were much more speculative than those built in the city. Though at great suburban lines were less expensive to construct, they also had a lower expectation of revenue. While in this city the demand was present through the high density of existing developments, the suburban lines in many cases went through greenfields. In contrast with the mainline railways, which had a long distance market and could add a station on an existing line to test a new short distance market at minimal cost, an underground extension required both the line and the station in order to provide a new service rather than through an initially sparsely developed area, what one might dub a railway to nowhere. The suburban development along the surface railway lines began early. In 1853, the Linton and Northwestern Railway advertised in the Illustrated London News, quote, to persons intending to build houses of a suitable character and of a value not less than 50 pounds annual rent within two miles of the following stations, viz. 
Harrow, Pinner, Bushy, Watford, Kings Langley, Boxmore, now Hemel Hempstead, and Tring, a free annual first-class pass to one resident of each such house for the following periods. Harrow, 11 years, Pinner, 13 years, Bushy, 16 years, Watford, 17 years, and the other stations mentioned, 21 years. The London and Northwestern Railway provided an enormous subsidy to the wealthy to build on land the railway did not own. The reasons for this can only be surmised. Was this to prime the pump, since the amount of revenue coming from these houses was an 11 to 21 year free pass, discounted back to the present, would be quite small? Was it to encourage non-work travel, especially by other household members? Or did the railway or its executives have a hidden interest in development somehow? Two decades later, the suburbs had begun to take shape. About the Barnett Station has sprung up within the last few years one of these new, half-finished railway villages, which we have come to look on as almost a necessary adjunct to every station within a moderate distance of London. The network in the northwest quadrant of London was the least dense with surface railway lines. Not surprisingly, those were the unharvested suburban pastures that attracted the most attention from the underground railways. The powers to develop land varied. The Land Clauses Consolidation Act of 1845 required that within 10 years, railways must dispose of land not required for the projects identified in the Parliamentary Act describing and authorizing the railway. The Metropolitan Railway Acts of 1868 and 1873, however, allowed the Metropolitan to hold on to such lands for a longer period of time, putting the Metropolitan into the development business in a way that other railways were not permitted. The lack of effort to get similar provisions inserted into the act of other railways suggests those railways did not wish to enter the development business. The Metropolitan Railway acquired surplus land as it acquired right-of-way. In large part, this was the acquisition of whole parcels when sellers did not want their property bisected by the railway. Unlike other railways in the UK, however, the Metropolitan had parliamentary authority to develop that land and did not sell surplus land as quickly as possible. The consequence of this was the development of Metroland and the ability to pay higher dividends due to its real estate division than other underground railways were able to. That said, other railways along with the Metropolitan did work with developers to obtain subsidies for building stations near their new developments and promising to run services. Charles Yerkes, 1837-1905, a Philadelphia bond salesman, was perhaps the leading entrepreneur of the rail transit era. He moved to Chicago in 1881 and earned a shady reputation due to some poor economic transactions associated with the Chicago fire. Nevertheless, Yerkes was able to buy respectability, which was for sale in the Chicago of the 1890s, and was able to acquire most of Chicago's public transport system through bribery of public officials. Eventually, he was driven out of town when the political winds changed and he was unable to obtain a fare increase, provoking riots in the attempt and wound up in London, where he helped build the loop and consolidate the underground. Yerke's life was fictionalized as the character Frank Cowperwood by novelist Theodore Dreiser in three novels, The Financier, The Titan, and the posthumous The Stoic. When Charles Yerke, who acquired a number of the deep level tube lines in the Metropolitan District Railway, as well as other transport properties, was investigating whether she should invest in the proposed Hampstead, now Northern Line, in 1900, the following came to pass. When they came to Golders Green, Lauderbeck, agent for Charles Yerkes, stopped and told Dalrymple Hay, British civil engineer, that here was the proper site for the terminus, meeting protest about the absence of houses by pointing out that, in the United States, railroads were built and the people followed. After visiting the site himself, Yerkes asked, where's London? And on being shown, turned to his companion with the words, Davis, I'll make this railway. White writes, The Hampstead, later Northern, line emerged into daylight to terminate in the fields bordering the Finchley Road. Most people were unimpressed by the wisdom of this move, but it is said a syndicate had already been formed to buy up the turnip fields before the announcement of the new line had affected land values. Thus, at Golders Green first began the typical pattern of 20th century suburban development, the arrival of an electric railway in some untouched rural area, soaring land values, semi-detached villas, and chain stores. Despite this activity, the sum of metro land developments created directly by the Metropolitan Railway and its subsidiaries amounts to only about 15,000 houses on about 2,200 acres. But when considering the accompanying private developments that took advantage of the accessibility created by the railways and thus gave traffic to the railways, the change was enormous. This change is illustrated in the figure, which shows the development of both railway networks and the population density of London from 1850 to 2000 
at 50-year intervals. Ultimately, the co-development of suburbs and underground lines came to a halt with the 1948 designation of a green belt around London. This resulted in the cancellation of proposed line extensions and hemmed in the underground served suburbs. Later suburban developments jumped the green belt, but these were to be served by automobile, bus, or surface rail. Eight point six discussion the land value metric. Transportation makes it easier to reach places. A transportation improvement may increase the value of a site for production or decrease the costs of consumption, that is, increase its economic rent. Thus, we expect that land value reflects the benefit with a higher market price. There is long-standing interest in measuring development impacts by observing land value changes. Speaking of a road opened in 1756, Reverend Young observed, it was no sooner completed than rents rose from 7 to 11 shillings per acre, nor is there a gentleman in the country who does not acknowledge and date the prosperity of the country to this road. Today, improved analysis techniques are aiding estimates of land value changes, and value capture to aid infrastructure financing is an attractive option to public agencies short of funds. Value capture dates at least from port financing efforts when French royalty first strived to develop colonies and expand maritime trade. The theory is simple in outline. All of the things being equal, land derives value from its location. A change in transport costs thus has a direct effect on the location-derived value of land. That simple mechanism is attractive to analysts. It fits very well with the view that benefits may be measured as user cost reductions. Analysts armed with benefit cost or similar ideas are cautious about claiming more than user cost savings. That is partly because of the experience as the interstate highway system was constructed. Many studies were made under the rubric highway impact. They were motivated by the notion that increments in land value might be captured to aid in financing the interstate. While impacts were often indicated, these tended to be modest and there were double counting issues, counting both user cost savings and increments in transport rents. Critics of study designs and workers concerned with the theory stressed that what was mainly observed was the shifting of development from here to there. That is development, which would have happened somewhere was focused on areas proximate to newly constructed facilities. The same story holds for urban transit development. Analysts have long known that as deployment winds down, development impacts are modest. Edwin Spengler found in his 1930 study in New York City that trends overrode impacts. If an area was declining, it continued to decline as public transport service was improved. Stagnant areas remained stagnant and growing areas continued to grow. Spengler's findings appear almost word for word in Walmsley and Parrott's review of the situation. Other studies tracing transit developments, impacts, have managed to find impacts, yet they are small. To magnify impacts, cities are encouraged to use zoning and other tools to concentrate development at transit stations. As stated, the transport rent, rent land value notion is simple, but in real world contexts, there are workings of land markets, agglomeration economies, and historic path dependence. It is partly for these reasons that very little can be said unless a great deal is known about households and the production processes of business firms. Yet, we can show that the land value is intimately tied to its accessibility to other pieces of land and their associated activities. If a transportation or land use change enables people to reach activities that are more desirable in less time, then the value of their land increases. Hedonic theory suggests that individuals do not purchase goods, but rather the bundle of attributes composing the good. Someone does not buy a house, but rather the qualities of that house, location, accessibility, size, type of construction, appliances, noise from nearby roads, and so on. Every house combines the various attributes slightly differently. Hedonic models are used to pull apart these attributes and develop demand curves for the various attributes, goods or bads. However, these attributes are interrelated. Houses with high accessibility will be more expensive, which will lead to more investment in other attributes, leading to better maintenance and more frequent remodeling. The hypothesis of the standard urban economic residential location model that individuals trade housing costs for transport costs has been tested in numerous studies. All else equal, housing prices decline as one retreats from the center of the region, the location with highest accessibility. Land rents influence land uses because the market asks that land be put to its highest and best use. Uses have to pay the rents. From this observation, we derive the notion that transport improvements may change patterns of land use. Some years ago, Garrison and colleagues engaged in extensive analyses of this proposition. Economies of agglomeration, central place theory, and some of the other processes bearing on land use patterns were considered. 
The general conclusions were one, patterns did change, and two, that benefits were present, termed reorganization or structural change benefits, although benefits were not easy to measure. Although the term reorganization benefits did not come into wide use, the idea is that one pattern of land use may be better than another and that transport improvements might change land use patterns remains popular. We hear that public transport investment will yield better land use patterns than it will highway investment. Of course, better is in the mind of the beholder. We have some difficulty with the notion that station-focused accessibility of transit improvements would produce a better stage as opposed to a different stage for the running of consumer sovereignty than the more diffuse theater given by highway investments. Reasoning from the dynamics of transport system development, the expansion of existing transport infrastructures using conventional technology in a mature market would not be expected to have much impact. The developments triggered by investments have already run their course. To put the matter at the extreme and use an overworked metaphor, observing land value change on a mature network is similar to observing deck chairs on sliding on the sinking Titanic and measuring changes in their comparative locational advantages.